Robbing banks, stealing fine art, and pilfering jewelry can be a lot of fun, but only when you've got a good team to work with. That's right, today's one minute game review is on Payday 3. I've never played a Payday game before, but I figured out pretty quickly that the ideal way to play is with a group of three to four people who all have mics so that you can talk to each other. Communication is the key to success and subsequently the key to having fun. There's nothing stopping you from playing the game solo, but this is a team game and that's where it really shines. The combat is super intense and weapons feel great, but that doesn't mean you have to go in guns a blazing. The different heist scenarios in this game have tons of stealth options for those interested. It can be really fun to work out the perfect under the radar robbery. Odds are though at some point the operation will go south and you'll have to resort to masking up, pulling out your weapon, and taking hostages. It's crazy high adrenaline fun so if you have a group of friends you play games with I'd give Payday 3 a go. Did you know that Capcom has released DLC for Resident Evil 4 Remake? It's called Separate Ways and it's a somewhat shorter campaign where you play through the events of RE4 again, but this time from the perspective of Ada. The Resident Evil 4 Remake was undeniably great, but is this $10 DLC worth your hard earned cash? Let's get into it. Although it's set at the same time and place as the main story, Ada's adventure is quite different from Leon's. She has her own plot lines, boss fights, and even some unique abilities like a grappling hook and an ocular spell spy device. Other than that, the controls, combat, and overall mechanics are exactly like the base game. There's the same weapons, items, inventory management, saving at typewriters, and shopping with the merchant. So if you're looking for something very different from the base game, this DLC doesn't deliver that. But I really enjoyed Separate Ways, and if you just want more RE4, you'll probably love this, because it really is interesting to see how Ada's adventure weaves its way in and out of Leon's story. Here are three reasons why Cocoon is one of the absolute best puzzle games. Number one, it respects your intelligence. There's nothing more annoying than having your hand held through a puzzle game, but Cocoon is one of those games that trusts the player and actually doesn't give you any instructions at all. It's up to you to discover how to progress and it's way more satisfying because of that. Number two, it's genuinely unique. In Cocoon, you travel between different worlds. The crazy thing is that these worlds are contained within glowing orbs that you carry around on your back. Because of this, you can do things like carry one world into another it's mind-bending in the best possible way and it creates some really fresh puzzles. Number three, it's not overpriced. $70 games are common now, but despite the fact that this is a brand new game, it only costs $20 to $25 depending on where you get it. It is a shorter game, but considering the quality, I think it's a great deal. And if you don't care about owning it and have a Game Pass subscription, it's there too. Let's just rip the band-aid off. The Crew Motorfest is almost indistinguishable from Forza Horizon 5. Both are beautifully vibrant, open world racers with incredibly similar visuals and gameplay. Now I loved Forza Horizon 5, but does that mean I automatically feel the same about the Crew Motorfest? Well, it does have some differences worth noting. Like a Motorfest is a bit more arcadey. Although the overall handling is similar, you're constantly doing nitro boost, and there's a larger emphasis on things like drifting and jumps. There's also different types of vehicles available to race, like boats, bikes, and planes, something absolutely not found in Forza. So Motorfest definitely does feel unique in some ways, but overall it's still super similar to Horizon 5. But I actually don't think that's a bad thing, because Forza games aren't available on PlayStation. So if you're a Sony gamer looking for something like Forza Horizon, the crew Motorfest is a great substitute. But it is a substitute that I don't think quite measures up to the game it clearly draws inspiration from. Still, I had quite a bit of fun playing through this one and can absolutely recommend it. I played Starfield as a Bethesda newbie and this is what I found out. Starfield is a mixed bag of extremes, both highly positive and highly negative. It's a staggeringly immense adventure that lets you explore the galaxy as you see fit. The sheer amount of mechanics combined with complete player freedom is truly magnificent. I was surprised by the emphasis on combat, but I ended up loving it. There's an impressive variety of weapons and I had a blast experimenting and finding my favorites. But Starfield has some pretty big flaws. You're asked to fast travel between planets constantly. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, it's not satisfying and it gets old very fast. The on-foot exploration of planets isn't much fun either, as points of interest are very spaced out with little in between. Despite all the freedom and variety that Starfield offers, I just never felt truly invested in its world or its story. It never made me want to dig deeper and discover all of its secrets. But that could totally just be me. I think that for certain gamers, Starfield will absolutely deliver, but it left me a bit cold. If you're a PSVR 2 owner like me, you know the struggle is real. The headset is awesome, but there just aren't that many exciting games to play on it. 
I didn't want it to become a $550 paperweight, so I tried out Resident Evil Village, a game that I've played before and knew I loved, but now I'd be experiencing the thrills in super immersive VR. I don't know if you've tried anything horror related in VR, but my god, the scares are definitely amplified this way. I didn't expect the game to feel so fresh, but actually being inside the game world almost made it feel like I had never played the game before. Every environmental detail from the dilapidated rundown village to the oppressive grandeur of the castle just feels so much more impressive and novel when it's totally surrounding you. Also, because the headset tracks where your eyes are looking, shooting and aiming is satisfyingly accurate and precise. It's super fun. I know this game wasn't originally developed as a VR experience, but that doesn't stop it from being one of the best games that you can play right now on PSVR 2. I feel like by saying this I risk being labeled as a Disney adult, but I can't lie to you. The new Switch game Disney Illusion Island is actually really good. You can play it solo, but it has the option for up to four people to all play together, and my wife and I played it as a duo. So what's it like? Well, it's a straight up pure platformer. There's actually no combat. It's all about clearing obstacles and avoiding enemies by using various abilities that you unlock throughout the game. As you gain new moves, more and more of the map becomes accessible and new challenges arise. I love games that cater to a wide range of gaming abilities. And this is the perfect example because you choose how many hits you can take before dying. I decided to be a sweaty tryhard and only gave myself a couple hearts, but if you're a more casual gamer like my wife, you can give yourself more or even unlimited hearts. You'll have fun no matter what though. Movement is fluid and responsive, the level design is super clever, and the quality of the animation and voice acting is just amazing. Why is it that Pikmin games are so hard to explain? Miyamoto originally thought that Pikmin would become the next huge franchise for Nintendo, comparable to Mario, but it didn't happen. Luckily, the series didn't die. In fact, we recently got Pikmin 4, and it's probably the best one to try if you're new. But if you've not played one before, you're probably not even sure what these games are like. Because they're so unique, I can't really point to another game and say, it's kinda like that one. Pikmin is really only like Pikmin. You could probably just call it a strategy game, but that feels too reductive to me. There's puzzles, exploration, platforming, combat, resource management. I can list the game's elements, but I'm not sure it helps too much. Even the visuals are confusing. You look at it and you see a cute kids game, but it's not. These games can be straight up brutal. Nothing will have you contemplating the frailty of life like a Pikmin game. They're super creative, and truth is, in order to understand what Pikmin is, you just have to try one of the games for yourself, and Pikmin 4 is the one I'd suggest. There's a black spot in Mario's history. Okay, actually, when New Super Mario Bros. first released, people really liked it. What they didn't like is that Nintendo then said, good enough, and basically released the exact same game three more times. The consensus is that the new Super Mario Bros. games are all too similar and too safe. But I've actually never played the first three games in the series, so it's time to see for myself if they deserve all the apathy they get. Today, we're looking at the game that started it all, New Super Mario Bros. for the DS. What sets this game apart? Well, there's the Mega Mushroom. Honestly, it's a total gimmick. It looks cool, but you only use it like twice. Much more utilized is the Mini Mushroom. It makes you small and weak. Yay. Okay, the new power-ups aren't great, but overall, the game's not bad. It does feel pretty generic, but at the end of the day, 2D Mario is pure fun. Now, will the next two games cause me to change my tune? I don't know, we'll have to see. You know how people say that gaming hasn't gotten that much better since the Xbox 360 and PS3? I've never thought that was true, but recently my wife and I played a game that made me think that maybe those people have a point. I swear, if I didn't know better and you told me that this game was released this year, I'd have no problem believing you. But get ready to feel old because Little Big Planet came out in 2008. That was 15 years ago. Yet to me, the graphics and art style are still impressive. Maybe my brain has been warped by playing too many games on Switch, but I just don't see anything in this game that screams 2008. Literally, the only thing that feels dated about this game is that it's stuck on PS3, which means you have to use a 6-axis or DualShock 3 controller, and they have not aged well. I haven't even mentioned the gameplay, but that's also fantastic. We played it in co-op, and it was so much fun. In fact, we highly recommend any of the Little Big Planet games. Final Fantasy XVI contains a lot of cutscenes. How many exactly? It's a little hard to calculate. One YouTube channel, Gamer's Little Playground, edited all the cutscenes into a movie that tips the scales at a whopping 20 hours. This runtime is inflated though because they also included a good amount of plot-related gameplay. 
a different channel, Gamers Prey, created an edit that only lasts around 17 hours. This one is almost entirely cutscenes and dialogue, but it still has some important gameplay moments. I would estimate that Final Fantasy 16 has around 15 hours of hands-off time where the player just sits back and watches the story unfold. Now, admittedly, it's a pretty epic story, so it may not bother you at all, but if you're more interested in gameplay, the amount of downtime will likely become a sore spot. The combat is genuinely fun and engaging, and I think this game is quite good, but just know that you'll spend almost half of your time in Final Fantasy 16 with your controller sitting idle in your hands. What's a forgotten game from your childhood that you randomly remembered existed and just had to go back and play? If you were a kid in the late 90s and early 2000s, you probably remember watching Dragon Ball Z on Cartoon Network. Well, this was my absolute favorite show. I was obsessed. I was glued to the TV every time it came on. I collected the action figures. I wore the hideous shirts. I learned to draw the characters. And in 2002, when I was 11 years old, my dream game released. Dragon Ball Z Budokai. I had no clue what Budokai meant, but that didn't matter because in this game you could not only play through every pivotal moment from the show, but you could also fight against your friends using essentially every character. It's probably been over 20 years since I've played this game, but the other day I randomly wanted to experience it again. It may not 100% hold up now, but the nostalgia rush I got from playing this thing was unreal. I highly recommend revisiting your old games. So much fun. Do you like the game Overcooked, but hate how it tears apart your relationship with anyone you try to play it with? Well, I'd recommend moving out instead. It's basically Overcooked, but instead of working in a dysfunctional kitchen, you work for a dysfunctional moving company. And although this game has the exact same vibe, it somehow just isn't as rage-inducing. I know because my wife and I were able to play it without contemplating divorce. Packing up everything together requires constant communication, but it plays out like a fun cooperative puzzle. Zany mishaps happen, but they're always hilarious. Yelling and telling your teammate to throw the refrigerator out the window is just funnier and more lighthearted than when your friend goes all Gordon Ramsay on you because you should be washing dishes and not chopping tomatoes. All jokes aside though, if you like Overcooked, you'll probably like moving out. It's a great co-op game that's best enjoyed with a group of friends. Have you ever tried playing a Resident Evil game in co-op? This has to be my least favorite layout for local split screen. It's not so much how small each screen is that bothers me, it's the fact that there's all this wasted space. It really bugs me for some reason. Only a few Resident Evil games feature local co-op, and if you can get over the layout of the two screens, a good amount of fun can be had playing these games. We recently played through Revelations 2, and overall we mostly enjoyed our time, but we definitely have our criticisms. The main one is that only player one can actually use guns. Player two plays is either Moira or Natalia, and they're both pretty helpless. Moira is afraid of guns, but at least she has a crowbar she can use to smack enemies. Natalia is a kid, so all she can do is point. Okay, I'm exaggerating, but only just a little. Natalia can pick up a brick and use it as a weapon, but it breaks after like three hits. Either those are some weak bricks or the girl must hit pretty hard. The co-op experience just isn't very balanced. Player 2 is a companion character that helps out and gets to solve puzzles and stuff, but they just don't get the same full experience that Player 1 gets. Today's one minute game review is on Cat Quest 2 played in co-op in 2023. Don't let the art style fool you. This is a fully featured, legit action RPG that just happens to feature a cutesy medieval cat and dog as main characters. You can play solo, but this game is tailor-made for playing as a duo. Local co-op RPGs are pretty rare, especially ones with this much charm. There's tons of humor and more pet puns than you could imagine. Cat Quest 2 is super approachable. There's one button for attack, one for dodge, and the shoulder buttons control magic abilities. Everything can be exchanged and upgraded, but it's all very straightforward, so you won't get menu fatigue. Also, every main quest, side quest, and dungeon is clearly marked with recommended levels. Follow these and you'll always know if you're ready for a challenge or not. Our only complaint was that by the end, the combat does start to feel a little repetitive. If you're a diehard RPG fan, you might find things to be a little too simplistic, but Cat Quest 2 is a great, unintimidating way to introduce yourself or someone else to RPGs. Let's start with what's great here. The movement and combat in Jedi Survivor are really top-notch. It's zippy and responsive, so traversing the environment, wall running, and platforming all feel incredibly satisfying. There are five different lightsaber stances, each catering to different combat styles, and it's fun to experiment and find the ones that suit the way you like to play. Just as you'd expect from a modern Star Wars game, the graphics and music are both stunning. Each planet you visit is meticulously designed for an immersive experience. But not everything is positive. The level layouts can be confusing, and the 
the game is still somewhat buggy despite receiving multiple patches. Also, the occasional puzzles you have to complete are pretty underwhelming, only adding lulls to an otherwise action-filled game. The overall story is okay, but it didn't resonate with me personally. The plot does its job in keeping the player in an almost constant state of action, so in that way, I guess it works fine. If you're looking for an exciting Jedi experience, you'll definitely enjoy Jedi Survivor. There are some flaws, but they're pretty easy to look past because the game is overall a blast. What if a game can make you feel deeply connected to a stranger? A stranger that you don't even have a real way to communicate with. Journey has been out for a decade, but I recently went into it blind, not even knowing what gameplay looked like. All I knew was its great reputation. Once I started, I was given zero instructions on what to do, but it seemed like I was supposed to go towards this looming mountain in the distance. The environment was desolate, but eventually I ran across another character that looked just like mine. At first I thought it was an NPC, but I started to think, wait, could this be another person also playing this game? We had no way to talk to each other, but it was soon clear. We were on this journey together. It was an oddly profound connection that I've never experienced before, especially from a video game. We shared a silent bond and supported each other through each of the game's challenges. Journey is a short and simple game, but through breathtaking visuals, evocative music, and subtle environmental storytelling, the game urges you to contemplate your own journey in life, and most importantly, the connections you forge along the way. In the world of gaming, few titles have captivated audiences quite like Dead Island. Released in 2011, it took players on an intense journey through a zombie-infested paradise. But the game's sequel, Dead Island 2, has become a symbol of the challenges faced by game developers. Originally slated for release in 2015, its development was riddled with setbacks, studio changes, and uncertainty. Development hell is not uncommon in the gaming industry, but Dead Island 2 seemed to be stuck in a perpetual loop. It changed hands multiple times, with each studio trying to salvage the project in their own way. They faced immense pressure from fans, critics, and the weight of the Dead Island name. But now, almost a decade behind schedule, Dead Island 2 is finally here. Truthfully, it may not be the masterpiece some fans were hoping for, but it carries with it a certain charm and self-awareness. Plus, you just have to appreciate the journey it went through. For better or worse, Dead Island 2 captures the essence of a bygone era in gaming. Some of its mechanics may feel dated by today's standards, but its sheer entertainment value shines through. It's a reminder that sometimes just being fun is the ultimate goal. Today we're reviewing the mind-bending cooperative game Ib and Ob. In this game, crossing through a portal brings you to an alternate plane where gravity is flipped. You'll need to work together and utilize the opposing gravities in order to succeed. Ib and Ob is a two-player only game that twists your brain in the best possible way. The art style, it's simple but effective. Everything is colorful and vibey. But let's talk about the gameplay. It's a physics-based puzzle experience where teamwork is everything. You have to coordinate your moves, defy gravity, and plan each step as you make your way through levels that'll have your head spinning, but in a really satisfying way. And the cherry on top is a great soundtrack. It really helps to have something nice to listen to as you solve those brain teasers. And some of the puzzles are quite challenging, but nothing ever feels unsolvable. We were able to finish the game without looking up any of the solutions, but there are definitely some head scratchers. There are very few dedicated co-op only games, but this is a good one that we absolutely recommend as long as you don't mind your brain melting a little. What if you took an arcade rail shooter, gave it a horror theme, and put it into VR? Well, you'd have Switchback VR, and it's a concept that sounds like a recipe for success. But this actually isn't the first game that this developer has created using this idea. Back in 2016, Supermassive Games released Rush of Blood for the PSVR, a game that I loved. You're on a horror-themed roller coaster with guns in each hand. It's the kind of thing that VR was meant for, and Switchback VR is just more of that. But I don't know, maybe the second time experiencing a game like this just can't have the same novelty as the first. Because honestly, although I liked Switchback, I just didn't love it like I expected to. The gameplay is solid, but besides a lot of jump scares, it just wasn't that scary. The levels are themed after each of the Dark Pictures games, and having played all those games, I enjoyed the references, I guess, but I definitely would have preferred to see some new, potentially more frightening environments. Switchback VR kind of fails in my mind because it just doesn't hardly bring anything new to the table for longtime fans of supermassive games. Do you think this is a true Bayonetta game? It's a complete departure from the original trilogy of games, which are known for having over-the-top action, intense combat, and a scantily clad protagonist. This new prequel, Cereza and the Lost Demon, takes a completely different approach, with gameplay that focuses more on exploration, puzzles, and platforming. 
It does have a fair bit of combat, but it's almost nothing like what you'd expect from a traditional Bayonetta game. Cereza, who's controlled with the left Joy-Con, is more or less a defensive character, while Cheshire, the demon, does most of the attacking and is controlled with the right Joy-Con. The game's visuals are rendered in a beautiful, soft, watercolor art style. It's a departure for the series, but it's also a perfect fit for the magical forest in which this game is set. So is Cereza and the Lost Demon a true Bayonetta game? Not really, but that doesn't mean it's not a good game. In fact, I quite enjoyed it. It's charming, the story is engaging, and the gameplay is entertaining. And thanks to the unique controls, my wife and I were able to each take a Joy-Con and play the game together, which was a lot of fun. PS4 gamers have been left behind, because although Horizon Forbidden West launched on both current and last-gen consoles, the new Burning Shores DLC is exclusive to PS5. It's $20, and some gamers are saying that it's too short to be worth it. But is it true? Burning Shores dives deeper into Aloy's character, showing a less stoic and more vulnerable side to her personality through her relationship with Seika, a new companion character. Everything takes place in a huge new area, the ruined remains of Los Angeles. A benefit of being a PS5 exclusive is that the environments look straight up incredible. The gameplay is mostly just more of the same from the main game, but there are some new weapons, outfits, and a new enemy type or two. Keep in mind, if it's been a while, it may take you a little while to get back into the swing of things. The combat is pretty complex, and the DLC just assumes that you remember how everything works. The main story will feel disappointingly short for some, but it has some pretty epic moments, especially towards the end. Now, if you're the type of gamer who likes to explore and collect everything, you could sink plenty of hours into this, but if you just power through the main campaign, it's gonna feel short. Is the Dead Space remake a good game for newcomers? If you're a fan of horror games, then you've probably heard of the cult classic Dead Space. Now, 15 years later, the game has been faithfully remade from the ground up, but is the remake worth your time if you never played the original? That was the boat I was in, and I just finished it. So newcomers, here's what you can expect. The game's atmosphere is oppressive and claustrophobic, but it looks great visually. The enemies, called necromorphs, are really aggressive, which makes this game stand apart from other survival horror games like Resident Evil. The combat is pretty satisfying, although a little repetitive. It has a cool dismemberment mechanic, but there are a number of different weapons and strategies you can use to take down enemies. There aren't really any cheap jumps scares, the game relies more on tension and stress to build fear. The overall plot and characters, they're decent, but what pushes the gameplay along is a long string of roadblocks that are so outlandish that they feel a little contrived, but this is a video game. If you think you'd like the Dead Space remake, you probably will, even if you don't have any nostalgia for it. It's high quality and absolutely worth checking out. Is the Resident Evil 4 remake as good as the original? RE4 is considered one of the greatest games of all time. Remaking it was risky because if there's one thing gamers hate, it's when companies mess with their favorite game in an attempt to milk it for money. On the bright side, Capcom's track record with remakes has been great. This new take on Resident Evil 4 is definitely darker in atmosphere and less zany than the original. They've gone for a more grounded and realistic approach, but they've kept just enough over-the-top action and one-liners to make it feel authentic and not too much of a departure. The environments are incredible. They've maintained the general feel of a lot of the iconic set pieces, but dialed the details up to 11. The new combat feels super modern and fluid, and there's still a good bit of challenge. Also added are new puzzles and encounters, which help to freshen up the experience for RE4 veterans. It's a perfect blend of old and new, faithful to the original while also bringing in fresh elements. It's definitely worth checking out whether you're a fan of the original or not. Have you ever heard people rave about a game that you'd know you'd probably love, but you just haven't gotten around to playing it yet? That was the case for me with Metroid Prime. And for the past few years, I really put off playing it because I heard rumors that a remaster was in development for Switch. And as you know, those rumors ended up being true. So I was excited to finally see what all the hype was about. Surprisingly, it's way more similar to the 2D Metroid games than I expected. Obviously, the perspective is different, but the gameplay loop is still centered around fighting off enemies while exploring until you find and unlock new abilities. Then you use those new abilities to access previously unreachable areas. Yeah, you might find yourself lost at times, but Metroid games are the absolute best at delivering an overwhelming sense of mystery and intrigue that makes you want to keep playing. In my opinion, the combination of combat, puzzles, and exploration all work together in perfect harmony. Sometimes I just don't understand Nintendo. When Super Mario 3D World was re-released on Switch, they made a big deal about how they had bundled in what was essentially an entire new game, Bowser's Fury. This encouraged gamers who had played 3D World to purchase the game again because Bowser's Fury wasn't sold separately. Well, Nintendo has utilized this tactic again. Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe also has a new added game bundled in, Magalore Epilogue The Interdimensional Traveler. But unlike 3D World plus Bowser's Fury, the main cover art makes absolutely zero reference 
reference to this added game. It's relegated to a tiny section on the back cover, which is a total shame, because in my opinion, it's just as good as the main game, and it's completely different. Magalore has an entirely unique moveset, there's a simple yet polished skill tree, you obtain increasingly more powerful abilities throughout the campaign, and the thing I like the most was that it has a great co-op mode. I think the Nintendo really messed up by not making a bigger deal about the Magalore epilogue. Every time you blink, you jump forward in time. Sometimes just a few minutes or days go by, but other times years pass when you blink. This is the concept behind the game Before Your Eyes, which uses eye tracking technology to recreate the surreal experience of life passing before your eyes. The original version of this game uses a camera or webcam to track your eyes, but recently it was ported to PlayStation VR 2. To me, this dramatically increases the immersion, and it's a perfect fit because the PSVR 2 has some great eye tracking built in. As for the game itself, I feel like it's important to set your expectations correctly. I'd say Before Your Eyes is 90% an experience and only 10% a game, but what an experience it is. I won't tell you much about the story itself, but I will tell you that it had a profound impact on me and really made me think about the importance of the little moments we often and take for granted in life. Admittedly, a game where blinking is your primary input may not be for everyone, but if you're looking for something different and thought-provoking, Before Your Eyes is absolutely worth a try. Anytime a game is remastered or remade, I'm immediately interested, especially if it's a game I haven't played before. Now I get to see for myself what makes this game so great. That was my mentality going into Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe, and the fact that the game features a co-op mode and I was going to be able to share this experience with my wife made me even more excited. There's just something undeniable undeniably fun about working together to make it to the end of each level while avoiding traps, taking down enemies, and defeating bosses. Player 1 is always Kirby, but additional players can be Meta Knight, DDD, or Waddle Dee, who all have unique but unchangeable movesets. But the game also allows for more than one player to be Kirby, which means everyone can enjoy the full experience of using Kirby's ability to inhale enemies and copy their powers. And the game's a blast. It's a relaxed mix of low-stakes combat, platforming, and puzzle solving. The difficulty spikes a little at the end but otherwise Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe is as casual as it gets. It's easy, but it's also super charming, and I understand why it's so beloved by fans. Is virtual reality a good medium for a city building game? Townsman VR is presented as an answer to that question, and I was able to try it out thanks to a review copy provided by Handy Games. The mechanic that justifies this game being in VR is that you can use your godlike hands to directly interact with the island cities that you're building. If you don't feel like waiting on a worker to slowly walk boards or stone to a building for construction, you can just pick up the supplies you need and quickly do it for them. Or you can pluck up the worker and throw them across the island to get them there faster. The hands-on element makes this game feel more fast-paced than other city builders I've played, which is nice, considering that play sessions are usually shorter in VR. Your goal is to continuously add to your village while also keeping your residents fed and construction resources in stock. You assign specific jobs to your villagers, but you can change their role at any time based on what you think needs to be done at the moment. It's all very straightforward, but it's satisfying and addictive. I'll admit, when I think of city builders, my mind doesn't instantly go to VR, but I think that Townsman VR proves that the concept works and makes for a unique experience in this genre of game. Did we finally get a Harry Potter game that's actually worth playing? I'll be honest, I expected Hogwarts Legacy to be a broken, buggy cash grab, because that's just the way it goes these days with so many licensed games. Every trailer seemed almost too good to be true, and I thought for sure I was going to be severely disappointed once I got my hands on the game. But here's the deal, Hogwarts Legacy may not revolutionize the genre of open world games, but surprisingly it does most things right. There's so much to see and do. The developers were obviously very passionate about the source material and the result is the most detailed portrayal of Hogwarts and the Wizarding World that we've seen in a video game. Also, I was convinced that there was no way a combat system that was entirely spells like Levioso and Incendio would work, but I found the combat to not just be functional, but actually quite challenging and fun. Look, I'm not going to say that this game doesn't somewhat rely on nostalgia, but in my mind, Hogwarts Legacy is more than just for Harry Potter fans. Let me know, do you agree and think that this is an experience that any gamer could enjoy? Were games just less forgiving back in the day? 1989's Super Mario Land for the Game Boy only has 12 levels, and the game can theoretically be completed in about an hour. Seems easy, but here's the catch. If you run out of lives and get a game over, you have to completely start again. There's no checkpoints at all. There's also no saving your progress either, so the only way to beat this game is to do a successful, complete run in a single sitting. It's a test of skill and endurance where, believe it or not, Mario is your greatest enemy. You 
see, the reason I wanted to play this game was to see how Nintendo handled bringing the Mario experience to a handheld for the very first time. And all things considered, they did a great job, but controlling this 12 pixel tall plumber is way more difficult than you might expect. This is not the type platforming you typically associate with a Mario game. You'll have to adjust your muscle memory, and it takes dedication, but sticking it out and completing a full run of this historic handheld game is super rewarding, even almost 35 years later. In today's co-op game review, we're looking at TMNT Shredder's Revenge. This is a retro-inspired, arcade-style beat-em-up brawler, a genre of game that Catherine and I hadn't tried playing together before. Honestly, I never loved this type of game back in the day when they were popular, so I wasn't sure if Kat and I would enjoy playing it now. But I'll be straight up, we ended up loving the short time we spent with Shredder's Revenge. But it really is a short game. It only took us a couple of hours to finish the campaign. Fortunately, this is absolutely the type of game that would be just as good, if not better, on repeated playthroughs. The combat is simple to pick up, but nuanced enough to not just be a button masher. There are actually some pretty challenging moments in the game, but playing in co-op makes the challenges much less daunting, and up to six people can play together locally. One of my unpopular gaming opinions is that I usually don't love it when a modern game uses a retro, pixelated art style to cash in on nostalgia, but for this game, I thought it actually worked really well. Besides the short runtime, there's just not much to hate on here. Shredder's Revenge is just good old-fashioned video game fun that's made even better when played in co-op. This is probably the most important VR game that PlayStation has ever published. First impressions are everything, and Horizon Call of the Mountain is the game that PlayStation has chosen to showcase the new PlayStation VR 2. The game looks impressive, but more importantly, it feels like a real full-length game and not just a short experience where you're along for the ride. There are actual video game things to do, like crafting weapons and ammo, upgrading armor, and exploring. Climbing is a big part of the game, and it's fun, but it's pretty brainless, as only a few climbing sequences require any thought to complete. For me, the best aspect of the game is actually the combat. I think that because of the eye tracking, aiming with the bow ends up feeling very precise. The size and power of the machines you fight is really awe-inspiring, and taking one down by dislodging its armor and targeting its weak spots is extremely satisfying. At the end of the day, Horizon Call of the Mountain isn't the best VR game I've ever played, but I think it does a decent job of showcasing the new PlayStation VR 2. The Callisto Protocol has received mixed reviews, to put it lightly. And after playing through the game, I have some ideas on why I think it's disliked by so many. Also, at the end of this review, I'll tell you the type of gamer who I think may actually love this game. I'm gonna be a little harsh, but overall, I did like the Callisto Protocol. It just has flaws that are hard to look past. I think the biggest problem is that what you see doesn't coincide with what you get. The visuals are truly amazing, but the gameplay just doesn't match the standard of quality set by the graphics. The gameplay isn't bad, but it's simple, somewhat repetitive, and stands in stark contrast with the detailed and elaborate environments. Gamers just don't like it when a game tries to present itself as something greater than what it actually is. They see straight through it. But if you're a fan of linear, straightforward, old-school survival horror games, I don't think you'll regret playing the Callisto Protocol. If you know what you're getting into and your expectations are lined up, you might end up really enjoying it. That way, the overly polished graphics feel more like an added bonus and less like the developers were overcompensating. If you're looking for a game to play with your partner or friend, you may want to check out Untitled Goose Game. It can be single player or co-op, and Catherine and I recently played through this one together. You play as geese who have made it their mission for some reason to just be total menaces. You're given a checklist and you need to do whatever you can to complete the tasks. Some are easy to figure out, but many others require a good deal of creativity and out-of-the-box thinking to pull off. No matter what though, you'll completely annoy and terrorize the citizens of this quaint town. The controls and gameplay are simple enough to be suitable for the less experienced players out there, but the puzzles are complex enough to intrigue even the most seasoned gamer. The piano soundtrack changes and adapts to the events on screen, which really adds to the vibe of this already charming game. Untitled Goose Game is an entertaining mix of puzzles and stealth that's perfect for playing with a partner or friend. So if you're looking for a fun and mischievous adventure, give this one a try. I was immediately worried because things were different. A Plague Tale Requiem trades the tightly structured stealth encounters that I had grown to love in Innocence for a more fluid, open-ended approach. You can now choose to fight or brute force your way past enemies if you don't feel like being stealthy. I was immediately resistant, feeling as if the game just wasn't as focused. But I honestly shouldn't have been so quick to judge because once I adapted my playstyle, I started to truly appreciate the magnitude of this game. 
From the environments to the story, Requiem is epic in every way, and a more action-oriented gameplay loop complements the narrative perfectly. The stakes have been raised, and it's reflected in how you play the game. If you are even remotely interested in what you see here, I would highly encourage you to try this game. I was skeptical at first, but it quickly won me over. Just make sure to play the first game for context and to fully immerse yourself in the story. Did you know that after the unexpected and wild success of Nier Automata, the previous game in the series, Nier Replicant, was remade and re-released in 2021. The original version on PS3 and Xbox 360 was sort of a cult classic, but it completely bombed in terms of sales. And it's crazy that a sequel ever got greenlit, but the gamble paid off because Nier Automata ended up being a smash hit, selling 7 million copies worldwide. So modernizing and re-releasing the original Nier game made a lot of sense because the vast majority of fans never experienced it. But is this new version actually worth playing? Well, Replicant may not be as good as its sequel, but it's still a great game. The revamped graphics and gameplay make this older title quite palatable, but the game still shows its age at times and can feel a little grindy. The combat is engaging and the characters are complex, but you'll have to finish the game multiple times to get the true ending. But those who stick it out are rewarded with a story that's amazingly powerful and completely unique. Catherine and I just finished a co-op adventure in a galaxy far, far away with LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga. With its high quality visuals, seamless co-op mode, and countless inside jokes, this game is going to be a big hit for a lot of you. But be warned, if you're not a diehard Star Wars fan, it may not quite hit the same way. This game follows abridged versions of the events from all nine films. Although we've seen them all, we are not huge Star Wars fans. And with this LEGO game, if you don't know the plots very well, the story is going to feel very disjointed and rushed. But let's talk about gameplay. Expect a huge variety of puzzles and action sequences. It's all very simplistic and low stakes, but it's not horrible. Our main complaint was that a lot of the game is spent simply walking to your next destination. Overall, the game does have a very premium feel, and the co-op mode is well implemented, making it worth considering even if you're not a Star Wars fan. Catherine and I thought it was just okay though. But let us know in the comments, what do you think about LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga? I'm surprised because I was skeptical about stealth games, but A Plague Tale Innocence has completely changed my tune. It's a few years old now, so a lot of you may have already played it, but if you're on the fence or if you've never heard of it, you're in for a real treat. I'm a sucker for a good looking game, and the stunning graphics and environments are what ultimately drew me in, but the gameplay exceeded all my expectations. It's a tightly crafted stealth adventure with no pointless filler and way more variety than you'd imagine. The characters, story, and pacing are also top-notch, making A Plague Tale Innocence an all-around great gaming experience. So for those who love story-driven single-player games, this is one adventure you won't want to miss. Comment below and let me know if you agree or if you've played this game before. I can't wait to see what you think. My wife and I play video games together every night, and if you saw our top 10 video for 2022, you know that we really enjoyed playing Little Big Planet 3 together last year. Since we enjoyed that game so much, we decided that we'd give the previous game in the series a go. We were happy to find out that, except for a few differences like the types of power-ups available, Little Big Planet 2 is pretty much exactly like 3. It's a wild and engaging platformer where the levels are multi-layered and blend 2D and 3D gameplay. The story is ridiculous and impossible to follow, but that doesn't really matter, it's all just about having a good time. Co-op mode can be accessed at any time just by turning on a second controller, and this is absolutely the type of game that goes from being good to great when played with a partner or friend. The only real negative I associate with this game is the fact that it's only available on PlayStation 3. In fact, there are so many great co-op games stuck on PS3 that I ended up buying a used console just so we could play them. So if you have a way to play it, we absolutely recommend playing Little Big Planet 2 in co-op. Okay, I've got a really divisive game for you today. I even have to be careful about how much I say because Doki Doki Literature Club is the type of game where what you see isn't necessarily what you get and the less you know the better. But what I will say is that this game is not for everyone. It starts you off with a warning for a reason. The storytelling is experimental to say the least and some delicate topics are handled in a not so delicate way. It can be difficult to recommend this game for that alone. But also it's a visual novel which is already not for everyone and the first few hours of the game are pretty slow. But once it picks up it becomes a true truly mind-bending psychological experience unlike any game I've played. For me, Doki Doki Literature Club really hit. It was super refreshing to play something that was actually different for once. But that was my personal experience. You'll have to decide for yourself if you think this game may be for you. Is it dumb to review a 3DS game 10 years after it launched? Maybe, but everyone has a backlog and I enjoy reviewing the games I play no matter how old they are. 
And recently, a game I played for my backlog was Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon. This entry in the series is mission-based, which makes it more handheld friendly. Still, it took me around 15 hours to finish, but I enjoyed my time. My only real problem with the game is that if you fail a mission, you have to completely start it over. Some missions are pretty long, and it can be frustrating to have to do everything again. But would I recommend playing this game in 2023? For most people, I'd say no, but only because Luigi's Mansion 3 exists on the Switch. It's newer, more polished, and overall just a better experience. But that doesn't mean that Dark Moon is bad. I wanted to play it because I like Nintendo games, and I'm interested in experiencing as many as I can. So if you're thinking about playing Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon, I'd say go for it. It's not bad. We're going all the way back to 2004 for today's game review and playing Katamari Damashi. Originally, this was only on PlayStation 2, but a few years back, the game was updated and re-released on all the major consoles as Katamari Mari Damashi Reroll. I rented the Switch version and it was my first time playing one of these games. Rolling up objects and growing your Katamari is super relaxing and oddly satisfying, but the controls are clunky and take some getting used to. Levels have different objectives. It's not always just about collecting as many objects as possible within a certain time limit, but for me, the moment to moment gameplay didn't have much variety and by the end felt monotonous. But keep in mind that your mileage may vary. You might never get bored with this. Depending on what you like out of a game, I could see this being an 8 or 9 out of 10 for some people. Katamari Damashi Reroll is a weird and quirky game that I did somewhat enjoy, but just didn't love. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet are not good looking games. When I first started playing Violet, I was immediately struck by the janky presentation and rough graphics. But as I delved deeper, I found that the game was a lot better than it looked. The new open world format allowed me to choose my own path, which made the game feel more strategic and challenging. And the new mechanics like auto battling add a level of variety to the core gameplay loop that I really appreciated. I've skipped a lot of the past Pokemon titles because they all felt more or less the same, but this was hands down the most fun I've had playing a mainline Pokemon game in a long time. Don't get me wrong, it's extremely disappointing that the performance and graphics of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet don't match the quality of the gameplay, but fortunately the majority of the problems are only skin deep. Did you know that there's a spin-off game in the Uncharted series where you play as Chloe instead of Nathan Drake? In Uncharted The Lost Legacy, you join Chloe and Nadine on a quest to find an ancient Indian artifact, the Tusk of Ganesh. Just like the other games in the series, the graphics are stunning and the action sequences have an almost cinematic intensity. However, I do have to say that I don't think it quite measures up to the main Uncharted games. It's a solid standalone title, but it doesn't have the same depth and emotional impact as the others. Chloe and Nadine are really likable characters, and their dynamic adds an interesting twist to the Uncharted franchise, but the overarching story just didn't grab me the way the others have. All in all, I definitely recommend giving Uncharted The Lost Legacy a playthrough, especially if you're a fan of the series. It's a fun addition to the franchise, but just don't expect it to top the original games. First of all, let's address the elephant in the room. It's no secret that Evil West takes heavy inspiration from God of War, but don't let that fool you into thinking that it's a cheap knockoff. The core gameplay may have been borrowed, but Evil West builds upon God of War's ideas to create a game that stands on its own and offers a unique and exciting experience. One of the standout features of Evil West is its combat system. Nearly every button on the controller commands a different weapon or ability, all with separate cooldown timers. You would think that this would be overwhelming, but the game teaches you how to manage the chaos by gradually introducing weapons throughout the course of the game. You start off with just one or two actions, but by the last chapter, you're an unstoppable force with seemingly infinite combat options at your fingertips, including ranged and melee weapons, special abilities, and powerful finishers. Evil West goes all in on one concept, extreme over-the-top action, and man does it succeed. It's a thrilling and immersive game that's definitely worth checking out for fans of action-adventure games like God of War. It was an unexpected pairing of franchises, but to most people's amazement, 2017's Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle ended up being a surprisingly good turn-based strategy game. Five years later, Ubisoft has now released a sequel, Sparks of Hope, but is this one as good as the original? Now that the novelty of the Mushroom Kingdom and Rabbids mashup has lost some of its potency, Sparks of Hope doesn't have to employ any plot gymnastics to convince the player that what they're seeing makes sense. In fact, making more sense is really where Sparks of Hope shows the most improvement from its predecessor. The skill tree and upgrading system is simplified and less confusing, the overworld is easier to navigate and no longer feels like a labyrinth, and each character has a more defined and perfect purposeful role. And the new Sparks mechanic is an appreciated addition that adds an extra level of strategy to each battle.
battle. When Sparks of Hope was announced, I wasn't entirely convinced that we needed this sequel, but because of all the refinements and additions, I ended up really enjoying my time with this game. Let me know what game you'd like me to play and review next. Okay, I know they're not the most amazing games in the world, but I'm one of the people who actually enjoy the Dark Pictures games. I think that, for what they are, they're pretty good. But the most recent game, The Devil and Me, just does so many things wrong. There are new traversal mechanics, and they work well enough, but the game acts like it's something seriously new and revolutionary. I hope that you think climbing is scary, because the majority of the first hour of this horror game is just spent scurrying up ledges, in full daylight. Also added is a simple inventory system. The coolest thing about it is that each of the five characters holds a unique item related to their job that can help them solve puzzles or survive in some way. One problem, the game almost never asks you to actually use these tools. It's like the mechanic never really progressed past the idea stage during development, but they shoehorned it in anyhow. As concepts, I honestly don't have a problem with any of the new features. I just wish they were implemented in a way that didn't come across as shallow and meaningless. Ultimately, they end up severely scarring what could have been at least an okay game in the series. It makes some people motion sick, the hardware can be expensive, and the games, well, most of them just aren't good enough to justify all the baggage. Because of that, it can be hard to recommend VR games, but I just can't help it here. I want to tell you about the Moss series, because I think these might be the perfect games for someone that's new to VR or even for those who think that VR games just aren't for them. Moss and its sequel are storybook fairy tales come to life, where you take on the double duty of playing as two separate characters simultaneously. You interact with the world in first person as a masked onlooker called the Reader. At the same time, you also control the game's protagonist, a mouse named Quill, in third person. The scaled-down environments are painfully charming and a delight to spend time in. And because each set piece is stationary, it's a very comfortable experience. Nothing's going to make you motion sick. The combat and puzzles are exciting and clever, and when you add in the fact that these games each cost less than half the price of most new games, I end up with nothing but good things to say. Moss and Moss Book 2 are both shining examples of approachable VR gaming in its best light. Have you ever just picked up and played a video game that you literally know nothing about? It can be fun to go into something with absolutely zero expectations and just see what happens. I recently did this with The Chant, and here's what happened. Pretty quickly, I figured out that this was a survival horror game somewhat similar to Resident Evil, but with a mystic psychedelic twist. The game is a little rough around the edges, so I could tell it wasn't a AAA game, but certainly not an indie either. Surprisingly, the core gameplay was decent. The combat's a little awkward, but it fits the vibe, and I think the developers want you to feel somewhat powerless. A lot of the game is spent exploring, searching for keys to unlock new areas, but also scattered around are healing items and supplies needed to craft weapons. There are some unique boss encounters towards the end, and you get one of three different endings based on your decisions throughout the game. No spoilers, but the endings are laughably bad, which ultimately leaves you with a bad taste in your mouth. I was worried about this year because 11 months went by and not a single new game came out that I considered to be a 10 out of 10 monumental game. Sure, there were some great games, but nothing completely blew me away. For a lot of people, Elden Ring is THE game of 2022, but it just didn't click with me, and I'm sure that there are plenty of others who feel the same. Still, throughout the entire year, I held out hope, because I knew that in November a game was releasing that could very possibly be THE game for me. Everything fell on the shoulders of God of War Ragnarok, and thank Kratos, it delivered. The environments, the performances, the story, they're all absolutely top-notch. And the combat. It can really only be described as peak video game fun. Everything comes together to create an experience that, in my opinion, is just more than what any other video game has been able to deliver this year. For me, this is the game that I'll associate with 2022. When you think of 2D platformers, your mind probably goes to Mario. But for me, the pinnacle of 2D platforming is embodied by a different mascot. Rayman. In my mind, Rayman games are the absolute best platformers out there, and if you're interested in trying this series out, there's no better place to start than Rayman Origins. Although this game is 11 years old, looking at it, you'd never know. Each level is gorgeous and meticulously designed. It's amazing how this game never stops throwing new ideas at you. There are over 60 levels to complete, and as you work through them, the difficulty gradually ramps up. By the end, the levels seem like they'd be impossible, but the game has been slowly training you, and when you get there, you're more than ready. Finishing the last few levels of Origins is one of the most fun and rewarding challenges in any video game. And if you can believe it, things are even better when playing with a friend. Luckily, this game supports up to four-player couch co-op. Rayman Origins is hands down one of the best platformers out there, and it's very close to perfect. For that, you need to look at this game's successor, but that's a review for another video. Brutal is the best way to describe The Walking Dead Saints and 
centers. This is a virtual reality survival RPG that's surprisingly fleshed out, especially when compared to other VR games. Set in New Orleans, you're on a mission that requires you to not only handle hordes of walkers, but also navigate the dangerous politics of two rival factions of survivors. Adrenaline pumping combat with both walkers and faction members is essential to your survival. The weapons are scarce and they break easily, so you have to scavenge and salvage items in order to craft new weapons and healing items. The gameplay loop is perfect for those who are willing to embrace the role-playing aspect of the game, but if you're primarily looking for combat, you may be disappointed with how much of the game's 11-hour campaign is spent looting and crafting. On the bright side, the voice acting and environments are both great. Combat with knives, pistols, and bows is brutal and satisfying. Unfortunately, most two-handed weapons, such as bats and shotguns, feel clunky and difficult to use. Overall, The Walking Dead Saints and Sinners is a high-quality VR title that'll really resonate with some, but will likely fall short for others. Do you remember The Crimson Room? In the mid-2000s, this hugely popular internet game was many people's first experience with the idea of an escape room. Eventually, the concept left the virtual realm and became real-life attractions where you discover clues and solve puzzles in order to try and escape. Now, things have come full circle with Escape Academy, a game that aims to take the lessons learned from real-life escape rooms and apply them back to a video game in an attempt to create the ultimate escape room experience. Escape Academy might be the best escape room game I've played, but I finished the game with the feeling that the genre hasn't reached its peak. The puzzles were top-notch, but the vibe was a little too cheerful for me. The Crimson Room prompted an overwhelming sense of desperate exploration that's missing in Escape Academy. The art style also just didn't click with me. My wife and I played this together, and we loved that the game had co-op play, but this mode was buggy for us. Sometimes one of our characters just wouldn't control correctly and button presses wouldn't be recognized. However, if you're a fan of escape rooms, you'll likely really Really enjoy Escape Academy. It's a franchise that's never received a whole lot of attention from the general gaming audience, but the games are highly regarded by those who've played them. The first two both reviewed super well, and the Switch has been an overwhelming success, but I was surprised to see how many people were hyped about Bayonetta 3. Now it's out, I've had the chance to play through it, and I have to say, this may be the strongest Bayonetta game yet but in many ways, it's also the weakest. With its combat and over-the-top spectacle, Bayonetta 3 reaches new heights. It's never been more exhilarating than this. The new summon mechanic feels perfectly at home, like it should have been there the whole time. Unfortunately though, the game is quite disjointed. The stealth sections where you play as Jean feel out of place and aren't much fun, and although the combat mechanics in the viola sections are fine, they pale in comparison to fighting as Bayonetta. There is a lot of fun to be had in Bayonetta 3, but for every step the game takes forward, it also takes a step back. Instead of eclipsing its predecessors, the game ends up averaging out to be just another solid Bayonetta game. Are video games art? Is a question that comes up from time to time. To many, it's a strange question to ask, because virtually every element of a video game, character models, music, performances, environments, they're all obviously art. But some games go above and beyond and really channel the games as art mentality. 2016's Inside is one of those games. In terms of genre, it's a puzzle platformer. The puzzles are interesting, but none will have you scratching your head for too long, and the platforming is decent, but nothing to write home about. Inside may not have bold, groundbreaking gameplay, but the rest of the experience is masterfully presented. Set in an extremely bleak world, the game tells a complex, mind-bending story without a single word of dialogue. It's a visual narrative where beautiful yet strange environments evoke questions while the actions of nameless, faceless characters gradually provide the answers. The eccentricity of Inside won't appeal to everyone, or maybe even most, but I suppose that's the price it pays for so blatantly defying the status quo. Shadows of Rose is the newest installment in the Resident Evil franchise, and although it's technically DLC for Village, Shadows of Rose feels much more like a standalone mini-sequel than an extension of the base game. Besides the familiar setting, this DLC feels quite distinct from Village. The most obvious change is the shift to third person, and although I enjoy the first-person perspective of the recent games, I'll admit that this change feels great. Shadows of Rose also brings in some fresh mechanics that are new to the series. Specifically, the main character Rose has magic abilities that are utilized in both combat and for puzzle solving. With Village, many fans were disappointed because, except for one specific part, the game wasn't very scary. Fortunately, Shadows of Rose works to right some of those wrongs by maintaining an overall higher scare factor throughout. If you liked that one section in Village, you'll adore this DLC. The game's runtime is quite short though, at a 
approximately three hours. However, this means that the game has absolutely no filler. It's a finely tuned experience from beginning to end. Today's one minute game review is on Costume Quest. If you're looking for a game to put you in the Halloween spirit, but you're not interested in scary horror games, this might be right up your alley. Costume Quest is set on Halloween night and you need to rescue your sibling because they've been captured by monsters that have overtaken the neighborhood. You battle against said monsters in turn-based combat. During these combat sections, the player character and companions are transformed into giant versions of whatever costume they're wearing. Outside of battle, you'll find and assemble a variety of these costumes by exploring the neighborhood and surrounding areas. The costumes are swappable and each has a unique move set. You'll also need to gather candy by trick-or-treating. Candy acts as the currency with which you can buy stamps, equipable upgrades that grant special abilities to help you in battle. Looking beyond the mechanics, Costume Quest nails the atmosphere and is embedded with tons of humor and wit. It does a fantastic job of capturing the essence of Halloween through the eyes and imagination of a child. The game is digital only, but it's also currently available on Game Pass. It's easy to understand why so many gamers are jaded. It can feel like the only games being released are either clones, pseudo sequels, or just straight up re-releases. And it's extremely rare that you find a game that feels truly inspired. Well, that brings me to Unravel in today's one minute game review. When you play Unravel, you can just tell that the development team had a genuine artistic vision. They dedicated themselves to the vision and made it a reality. The gimmick of this game is that you control a little yarn creature, and as you travel, a strand of yarn is continuously unraveling in your wake. You throw, tie, and swing from the yarn in order to solve puzzles and traverse. The gimmick is great, but it's the atmosphere of the game that's most impressive. This is hands down one of the most beautiful games out there. The music is perfectly paired, changing and morphing from calm and serene during the puzzle sections to fast and excited when the action ramps up. Unravel ultimately presents an overarching theme of reflection. The game wordlessly encourages players to take time and appreciate the small things in life, from day-to-day -day experiences to the people who we share these experiences with. Everyone's looking for spooky games to play right now, so let's talk about the Dark Pictures games. Essentially, these are interactive horror movies. Right now, there are three available, but the fourth game in the series is slated to arrive in late November. I love recommending these games to people because you really don't even have to be a quote-unquote gamer to enjoy these. Making choices and responding to the occasional button prompt is all that's asked from the player. Your actions and decisions shape the flow and outcome of the story. Characters can survive or die based on what you choose, but you can't win or lose. Also, up to five players can share the experience in local co-op play, which is great for game and movie night get-togethers. Each of the Dark Pictures games is a standalone experience, so you don't have to worry about playing them in any particular order, although I will say that Little Hope is my personal favorite. Paper Mario for the N64 has become one of the most expensive and sought-after games that Nintendo published for the system, but it hasn't always been that way. For the better part of the last two decades, loose copies of Paper Mario were selling for around just $20 to $30 a piece. But in May of 2020, Nintendo announced a new game in the Paper Mario series, The Origami King. Overnight, the price of Paper Mario for the N64 skyrocketed. Luckily, prices have come down a little since then, but loose cartridges can still sell for over $100 on eBay. So why do people love this game so much? First of all, the game features unique RPG mechanics that are fully fleshed out, but also simple enough to not be overbearing or tedious. The game also has a really interesting story and a distinctive set of original and funny characters. And finally, the paper-inspired art style has aged so much better than most of the games in the N64 library, making it one of the easier games to go back to and revisit. Today's one minute game review is on Stray. By now, you've probably at least heard about this game. Playing from the viewpoint of an adorable orange cat has intrigued gamers the world over. My wife and I, being cat owners, were certainly interested, so we jumped on the game day one once it was released physically. And although it's obvious from footage that this game has tons of character and fantastic visuals, the question remained, is the actual gameplay as enjoyable as the art style, or does Stray rely too heavily on its gimmick? The first thing you need to know is that Stray is largely just an exploration game. Roaming around and soaking up the scenery, all while being a cat, is what this game is all about. There are puzzle and action elements sprinkled throughout, but first and foremost, Stray prioritizes atmosphere over everything else. If that sounds like something you want to experience, this game is probably worth your time. It's a straight vibe. However, if the gimmick doesn't interest you, I doubt you'll find the gameplay good enough to change your mind. You can skip this one without feeling like you're missing out on something too spectacular. Today's one minute game review is on Nier Automata from Platinum Games. 
I've struggled to write this review. In a way, I'm stuck because I'd absolutely love to tell you everything about this game, but I also really, really don't want to tell you anything about this game. Those of you who have already played Nier Automata probably understand, because some things are just best experienced without clear expectations, and in my opinion, this game is one of those things. So you'll have to excuse me for tiptoeing around and not giving a proper review. But what I am going to do is tell you this. Lots of games are fun. Some games even go well beyond what I consider to be simple entertainment. Still, very few are objectively worth your time. Nier Automata is worth your time. Today's one minute game review is on Splatoon 3's single player story mode. Although Splatoon games are primarily known and enjoyed for their online multiplayer turf battles, games also feature single player, story driven experiences. And with the release of Splatoon 3, there's a new campaign to play through. But is this mode worth your time? Well, competition in the online modes of Splatoon 3 can be pretty fierce, especially for newcomers to the series. Luckily, the story mode is the perfect way to familiarize yourself with the mechanics of the game without the pressure of competing against others. The single player mode is level based, with each level acting as a themed challenge. Some levels focus on mastering a specific weapon or skill, while others are puzzle based, and some are simply combat challenges. But no matter the theme, almost every level was a hit for me, and I was surprised at how much I enjoyed working my way through each challenge. Throughout the campaign, you're introduced to and taught how to use each of the game's weapons and specials, but the story mode isn't just for newbies. No matter your skill level, you'll likely find the puzzles and challenges to be fast paced and fun. Today's one minute game review is on The Last of Us Part 1. There's been a lot of controversy over The Last of Us Part 1 being priced at a whopping $70. Some folks are okay with the price, but many others disagree and think that the game is nothing more than a thinly veiled cash grab. Understandably, the debate around pricing is always at the forefront of any conversation around this game, but that's really muddied the waters for newcomers who are trying to decide if Part 1 is a worthy way to experience The Last of Us for the first time. If you check the Metacritic scores, it might lead you to believe that this remake is an undeniable downgrade from the original. However, when you start reading reviews, you find that virtually every negative review is centered exclusively around the price, not the quality of the actual remake. So if you are a newcomer overwhelmed with all the noise, here's the deal. The overhaul visuals and added features make part one the new definitive way to experience The Last of Us. The remake is amazing, but The Last of Us is a masterpiece no matter what version you play, and the older versions still provide excellent experiences at a much lower cost. Today's one minute game review is on Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons. When you start a co-op playthrough of Brothers, you're immediately met with a warning explaining that the game is not intended to be played in co-op. And that's because for the first six years of its life, Brothers was a single player game only, where the two brothers are moved individually by the two thumbsticks on the controller. But in 2019, the Nintendo Switch received an exclusive version of the game that contained a co-op mode. But why would the developers go through the trouble of adding a co-op mode just to discourage players against it? Because if you disregard the warning and play the game in co-op, you'll find a game that you would swear was developed as a co-op only experience. After all, this was the first game by Joseph Fares, who later went on to create the co-op masterpieces A Way Out and It Takes Two. The co-op mode does remove the challenge of controlling both brothers at once, but I would argue that the true purpose of this game is more about the adventure and experience than the challenge, and what a magical experience it is. I would absolutely recommend Brothers to anyone, whether you intend to play in co-op or single player. Nintendo Switch Sports. There's six sports to play. Overall, they're okay and fun-ish, but nothing's that special, except one. One sport stands out as being 10 times more fun than the rest soccer, and it's purely because Nintendo just copied Psyonix's homework. Now one could argue that Rocket League is just soccer with cars, so of course Switch Sports Soccer will feel like Rocket League. But FIFA doesn't feel like Rocket League, Mario Strikers doesn't feel like Rocket League, but besides a few small differences, soccer in Switch Sports is basically a Rocket League clone with motion controls. But I don't want you to think I'm just hating on Nintendo, because even though it's essentially a clone, I think Switch Sports Soccer is amazingly fun. In fact, it's the only sport in the collection that my wife and I found ourselves playing over and over. The crazy motion controls work surprisingly well, and that's important because the motion controls are the one thing that differentiates this soccer game from Rocket League and makes it something worth experiencing. Now, does one good minigame make Switch Sports worth the $50 price tag? Well, that's for you to decide. Did you know that this game existed? Four years before the big sequel, Double Fine Productions released a VR game set in the Psychonauts universe called Rhombus of Ruin. What's weird is how high quality it is, 
yet it's flown completely under the radar for most people. It's a great example of a game that knows its constraints and doesn't try to go beyond the scope of what works in virtual reality. For example, a 3D platformer probably wouldn't have worked, but a first person point and click adventure is perfect for VR. And it also makes perfect sense as a Psychonauts game because abilities like clairvoyance, telekinesis, and pyrokinesis make for both clever and completely original puzzle solving mechanisms. Now I'm not saying this is the best game in the entire world. It's only two hours long, and because it's puzzle based, it doesn't have much replay value. But I just finished playing it and I was surprised because I found Psychonauts and the Rhombus of Ruin to be a really well put together VR experience. And it's just kind of weird that such a solid game has seemingly slipped through the cracks of the gaming consciousness. Hey everyone, it's Randy from Gaming Gig. Today's one minute game review is on Ghost of Tsushima from Sucker Punch Productions. When Ghost of Tsushima was first announced, I was amazed by the visuals that were presented in the trailers, but I decided to pass on it because I've been pretty burned out on open world games for quite a while now. But after almost two years of being told how amazing the game is, I finally broke down and decided to give it a go. Yeah, Ghost of Tsushima is an open world action adventure game that takes a lot of inspiration from similar games such as Assassin's Creed, but what sets this game apart is its extreme level of polish and attention to detail. The game's runtime is not artificially bloated with pointless fetch quests. The main storyline is a well-paced, tight package that at no point feels unnecessary. The art team created a world that's amazingly stunning, but that also feels realistic and appropriate to the setting. And with a move that I thought was impossible in the gaming industry, they hired voice actors who actually cared about delivering half-decent lines in two different languages. Ghost of Tsushima is a phenomenal example of what an open world action adventure game can be. So even if you're burned out on the genre, I'd give this one a try. When Pokemon first released in the 90s, the games unexpectedly took the world by storm. Millions of gamers, including myself, fell in love with the franchise, and Game Freak has successfully capitalized on the success, pumping out one game after another. But gradually, gamers have realized that every mainline Pokemon game is more or less all the same. Although some fans argue that the gameplay loop is perfect and shouldn't be altered, many have been asking for a shakeup of the core series. Enter Pokemon Legends Arceus, Game Freak's first real attempt to try something new with Pokemon. You can roam freely choosing when you want to catch, battle, or just inspect the Pokemon around you. It feels organic and it's a breath of fresh air for longtime fans. Sure, there are some growing pains, you need to grind to rank up, the story isn't all that compelling, and the graphics are almost objectively poor. Still, Arceus is fun, but it's not the earth-shattering game that some expected. I see it as a step in the right direction, and an omen of good things to come, as Pokemon Scarlet and Violet were just announced to be open world, drawing off the gameplay of Legends Arceus. Today's one minute game review is on Deathloop from Arcane Studios. The advertisements and trailers for Deathloop, and there are a lot of them, led me to believe that this game would be a run-based roguelike or roguelite. It didn't seem like my cup of tea, but once I got into Deathloop, I found out that the game really wasn't run-based at all. Sure, the story heavily revolves around Colt being trapped in a time loop, but because you can choose where and when you start each loop, the gameplay ends up being almost entirely mission-based. You can't even attempt a full run until you've finished all the missions the game gives you. I might argue that the game could be considered the lightest of roguelites, but let's not get too caught up in labels. The real question is, is Deathloop worth your time? I can say that, although I'm not a fan of first-person shooters, the game was still enjoyable to me. The shooting mechanics were tight and satisfying, the story was interesting if a little simplistic, and the movement was extremely fluid and fun. The game wasn't overly long, and at the end, when you are finally tasked with completing a full run, the game reaches peak excitement. Hey guys, Daniel from Gaming Gig here. So like many of you, I'm assuming, I recently picked up Sifu, and now I'm pretty much convinced that I'm Bruce Lee, or Jackie Chan, or any of those BA Kung Fu movie stars. This game just does such a great job of making you feel cool, and that's not something I can say about every game. I've never played a game with such polished fight scenes. Every takedown animation flows so well with the rest of the fight, and the interactions with the environment do such a great job of never looking awkward or forced. I'm honestly floored with how well a game with only five levels can hold my attention, but it's the fantastic level design, the replayability, and the constant need to perfect every encounter that keeps me coming back. It also has this cool aging mechanic that pretty much forces you to get good as you become this aging kung fu master. Otherwise, you'll be a 70 year old man going into the second level and you'll never make it. I'm on the fourth level now, so be on the lookout for a full review of this one once I finish. Hey everyone, it's Randy from Gaming Gig. Today's one minute game review is on Human Fall Flat from Curve Digital. 
My wife and I are always looking for co-op games to play, but I'm not going to lie, I was fairly hesitant going into Human Fall Flat because this actually wasn't my first experience with the game. I had tried it out on Stadia a year or two ago when Google sent me a Stadia controller for being a YouTube Premium subscriber. I had played through the first few levels and honestly wasn't very impressed. The wonky ragdoll physics came across as cumbersome instead of entertaining, and the puzzles weren't challenging beyond the difficulty of just controlling your character. And this go-round, Catherine and I pretty much felt those exact same feelings of disappointment when we worked through the first few levels in co-op. But as we progressed through the game, we became better and better at controlling our character, the puzzles became more difficult and rewarding, and we found that playing with someone else made the frequent failures hilarious instead of frustrating. The more we played the game, the more we grew to love it. And by the time the credits rolled, we were honestly disappointed that the game had come to an end. I think I'd say that the game is maybe best enjoyed as a co-op experience. So recently my good friend Tyler, you'll frequently see him in the comments section, sent me a recommendation to check out Vampire Survivors on Steam. After reading a quick review and seeing that it was only $3, I downloaded the game. Man, am I glad I listened because this game is fan-freaking-tastic. He describes it as the best dollars to fun ratio ever, and that's right on the money. Vampire Survivors is basically a tower defense game in which you are the tower and you can move. In fact, that's all you do is move. All of your attacks and abilities that you use to defend yourself against the ever-growing hordes of monsters trigger automatically, and the only input you have is movement. It's super addicting to bob and weave your way through hundreds of bats, ghouls, and werewolves while collecting gems to upgrade your abilities. The game is fast-paced, and you can burn an hour without even blinking. It's in early access right now on Steam, so head on over there and pick this one up. You won't be disappointed. Also, I haven't spotted any vampires yet, but there's garlic! Today's one minute game review is on Bully from Rockstar Vancouver. Bully's elevator pitch is that it's a Grand Theft Auto style game, but set at a boarding school. The guns and knives have been traded for slingshots and firecrackers, and the cars, boats, and planes have been swapped for skateboards, bikes, and scooters. You play as the 15 year old rebel Jimmy Hopkins, who is recklessly determined to take over Bullworth Academy by controlling the school's various cliques. Bully focuses more on hand-to-hand -hand combat than other Rockstar titles, and although the fighting mechanics are a bit clunky for today's standards, it still feels quite satisfying to take out opponents. Rockstar games from this era are known for having missions that are stupidly frustrating. And Bully does have some frustrating moments, but for the most part, the missions are more fun and less... No! God, please, no! No! The characters and storylines are hilarious, if a bit cliche, and the game sold decently well back in the day. So why no sequel? Well, a second game was reportedly in development, but the devs were pulled off the project to help Red Dead 1 get across the finish line. Today's one minute game review is on WarioWare Get It Together by Nintendo EPD and Intelligent Systems. I had never played a WarioWare game before, but when Get It Together was announced, the hype that surrounded the game was contagious. It looked unlike any game I had ever played before, and as it turns out, that was absolutely the case. Get It Together plays like a fever dream, but in the best of ways. At first, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, but by the end, I definitely had no idea what I was doing. Just kidding. Kind of. I did get used to the general format and objectives of the micro games, but because of the absolutely frantic presentation of the game, there were still plenty of times towards the end of the story mode when I would just end up flailing the joystick and hoping for the best. Sometimes I was successful, other times, not so much. Overall, I gave WarioWare Get It Together an 8 out of 10. While not exactly the deepest game I've ever played, it is a lot of fun, and if you're looking for a new party game, I don't think you'd regret picking this one up. Today's one minute game review is on Forza Horizon 5 from Playground Games. When I first got a Series X, I gave Forza Horizon 4 a hesitant download on Game Pass, not because I wanted to play the game, but purely because I heard the game had great visuals. What I discovered was that, yes, the visuals were amazing, but more interestingly, I had found a racing game that actually made me want to keep playing. When the fifth game in the series was set to be released, I was cautiously excited because Horizon 5 would have a lot to live up to in my mind. Besides the new setting, which is now Mexico instead of Great Britain, Forza Horizon 5 is just more of the same gameplay-wise, being a direct continuation of the fourth game. But this is exactly what I wanted because the gameplay was already superb, striking that perfect balance between hardcore realism and arcade-like craziness. The fifth game does have some really nice visual enhancements, looking almost photorealistic at times, and the 50% bigger map holds a vast array of beautiful locales and regions. Even if you're not a fan of racing games, I suggest that you give Forza Horizon 5 a try. Today's one minute game review is on The Messenger by Sabotage Studio. The Messenger is an absolute masterclass in all that is well and good with retro inspired action platformers. 
clearly taking inspiration from the likes of Ninja Gaiden and Shinobi, the messenger manages to keep one foot planted in the 8 and 16-bit eras of yesteryear while also feeling fresh, modern, and extremely challenging. This game is full of charm, and the dialogue is overtly self-aware, frequently breaking the fourth wall in hilarious ways. And it even manages to flip-flop between 8-bit and 16-bit graphical styles in a way that is both satisfying to the player and faithful to the story being told. I won't spoil this in a one-minute review, but The Messenger even manages to fundamentally change in some genre-bending ways in the last half of the game. I could gush for hours about this game, but that wouldn't exactly be on brand. So all I'm saying is, play The Messenger. You won't regret it. Today's one minute game review is on Unsighted by Studio Pixel Punk. Unsighted is a tale as old as time. Humans have waged a war against the sentient robots called automatons that they themselves created. You play as Alma, one of many automatons trying to fight back and save her kind. You know, typical video game tomfoolery. On the surface, Unsighted is a top-down Zelda-like that focuses on puzzle solving, item collecting, and some really tight combat. But what really sets it apart is that every automaton in the game, including all NPCs and Alma, have a timer displaying how much energy they have left before they basically lose their minds and go unsighted. This forces the player to make some really difficult decisions and literally decide who gets to live and die. Also, if Alma's runs out, it's game over. It's this unique, stress-inducing mechanic combined with some really excellent core gameplay that, in my opinion, make Unsighted a must-play. Today's one-minute game review is on Unravel 2 from Coldwood Interactive. Although it can be played single-player, Unravel 2 is, at its heart, a cooperative puzzle platformer where, in order to traverse the world and solve puzzles, you and a partner need to work together and manipulate a shared strand of yarn that is strung between your two characters. You can also use the yarn to swing from, climb up, and bounce around the terrain. The unique yarn mechanics alone could make for a fun game, but Unravel 2 delivers well beyond simple entertainment. The movement is extremely fluid and satisfying, the puzzles are clever without feeling overly difficult, and my favorite thing is that the understated music combined with the smoky, tilt-shifted art style creates an atmosphere that's extremely relaxing. Kat and I have played a lot of games together, especially platformers, and we agree that Unravel 2 sits at the very top of co-op games in its genre. We're always looking for new couch co-op games, so if you have any recommendations, let us know in the comments and we might just play and review your game suggestion next. Resident Evil 4 is one of only a very few games that seems to have been given the title of Legendary, with many regarding it as one of the greatest games of all time. But for whatever reason, I hadn't played it. But then, the perfect storm happened. A VR version of RE4 was released on the Oculus Store. So a week or so ago, when I was looking for a new VR game to try, it was finally time to see if the game could live up to all the hype almost 20 years later and on a gaming platform it was never initially intended for. I'm almost to the final chapter of the game, and here's my impressions. This game really holds up. Some Resident Evil games, especially the early ones, can come across as confusing and convoluted to me, but RE4 has the most polished and refined gameplay I've seen in the series so far. The puzzles, inventory management, and that special brand of horror are all in their purest forms. I know this game wasn't originally intended to be played in VR, but that doesn't stop it from being one of the best VR experiences I've had.